snoring ass dogs. All right, we're doing a tap in, man. Friday night tap in. Everybody pop on in the room. Friday night tap in. How y'all doing, man? Not done a live. It's, it's been a little piece since I've done a live, but I'm here. How y'all living? Black? Well, look at y'all lovely people in here popping in. What's up, brother Rossi? Rossi Wayne. How y'all living, man? Court, court. I see you, beloved. I see y'all. Just tapping in. I've been tapped in with y'all, man. Just wanted to see what's on your mind. What's going on with y'all, fam? Everybody, pile on in, and why don't you um? Retweet this. Let everybody know that we're live now. Ladies and gentlemen, retweet this. Just doing some briefing on what's going on during the week. Um, the reparations task force, I've been seeing some videos of some of the um, stuff that's been happening at these task force meetings. Um I've been um, out of out of state. I was in Texas all this week, and I wanted to go to the Sacramento meeting because, and to be honest, man, some of these meetings that I'm seeing, some of these hearings, there's a lot of foolery going on, man. You know, folks up there just really being very performative with a lot of stuff, and, you know, we got to get real serious about what's happening. I, I've seen a lot of straight up foolery going on at some of these um reparations hearings man and it's not a good look and i want to see when the next ones are when the next ones are going to be happening because i really want to get up there and um chop up some game and just kind of bring some clarity to what needs to be said and what's what needs to be done we got to really be focused on the lineage based part of the reparations we really need to be focused on that lineage based reparations and another thing we got to watch out for I saw this on one of my lives the other day and I, I caught on to it after the fact there was one guy some of y'all might have watched it it was my Instagram live and a brother called up and he was just going out of his way to to show some of his lineage he was like yeah man at my fba my grandmother my great 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 grandmama this and my great 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 grandmama that and i got a picture of a great great grandmama she a cherokee and she half black and this and and some of the dude that some of the stuff the dude was saying he's like yeah i'm a big fan i'm a big fan whoop de whoop but some of the stuff he was saying wasn't really making sense. And I'm like, wait a minute. When I thought about it after the fact, somebody brought this up and then, then I kind of thought about it. They said, hey, what if this dude, that dude sound like he was capping, man. This dude sound like he might have been some kind of um, undercover tether. You dig? Trying to finesse a lineage. So we got to watch out for that stuff. Some of the stuff he was saying, he was like, he wasn't sure he was FBA and he had all of this confusing documentation, quote unquote, that looked real funny style and it sounded funny style. He said something about somebody from his family in the 1800s came, they came from Nigeria, they were brought over from Nigeria. And I'm like, that would be hard to, that would make sense. That right there kind of stood out when he said that. Cause it was a lot of, it sounded like a lot of plebiscite babble and then when he said that somebody was brought over from Nigeria in the like the mid 1800s, that right there raised my antenna because I know that they weren't really bringing people over here then like that. And plus, Nigeria didn't exist. So, as we know it, as we know it, it didn't exist as we know it, and they had banned the transatlantic slave trade in America. You couldn't really bring people over here and, and document them. You know, you had a, an undocumented thing going on, but that was rare for the most part. So they wouldn't really have a record of that if they brought somebody over from the area now known as Nigeria in the mid-1800s. They really wouldn't have a record of that. So when people say certain things, we we if we have an understanding of history, we gotta let our antennas go up a little bit and 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 have us check people's paperwork because what dude was saying 
some of it sounded semi-legit, but then some of it sounded questionable. So we have to be careful because what we might have when we get this reparations thing going, we might have a lot of $5 FBAs out here. We might have tethers out here with a bunch of bogus paperwork. And this is why, this is what it sounds like is about to start veering into. We might start veering into some of these tethers because these tethers, you know, hey, these tethers be scamming their ass off. They might start, they they might be out here right now cooking up some bogus paperwork, finding some paperwork on somebody. You understand what I'm saying? And then trying to claim it. They might go and try to find the paperwork of some deceased person. This was one of the scams they would do in the, the 70s and 80s before the internet really got popping. In order to steal somebody's identity, people would go and find go to a graveyard or look in the newspaper in the obituary section and find a deceased child and then steal that child's identity. They would find out what the child's social security number was and, you know, find out the child's parents name and they would just steal the identity of the child. So they had all types of very covert scams going on back in the seventies and eighties. So some of those scams can still be utilized. Um, some tether can go find um, some deceased black person and then find out what their lineage was and then assume that identity and then start getting a whole bunch of paperwork based on this assumed identity and start claiming, hey, I'm FBA too, nigga. You know, they, they'll play that game because like I said on my, my broadcast the other night, a lot of these non-FBA cats, a lot of them don't have birth certificates. And they really got mad at me for pointing that out. Oh, they really got mad. The, the tethers are so mad at me right now. They're so mad. They're, they're sweating, spitting, crying, and musty. Very mad at me right now because I, that's a secret that they did not like exposed. I exposed a major secret about how a lot of them actually do not have birth certificates. And they're over here under assumed um, births. They, they got that January 1st thing going and they're really older than, than what people believe many of them, which is true. And you guys can Google that. And there's been instances where there's athletes and people have questioned the validity of their ages when they're non FBA. Some of these non FBA players, Manu Bowl is one of them. Manu Bowl, he was, um, one of these cats, who um, played in the NBA and folks were for years saying he was way older than what he really was because he didn't have official birth records, which a lot of them don't, which is, this is the truth. So I'm not beating up on anybody. We're just, you know, bringing facts to the table. So we got to really watch out out here. Uh, we got a lot of folks in here. Um, Y'all raise your hand if you want to get on. I'm going to get some folks in here in a minute because I want to see what's on your mind. And by the way, guys, we just, I posted a picture. Did you see the picture of the new John Henry Clark um, bust that we got? We just put that up today in the Hidden History Museum. I was very excited about that. We're waiting on that one for a few months, and it finally came in, and that's a great-looking bust of Dr. John Henry Clark family. We have the only, that is the only bust of the immortal John Henry Clark that's the only bust in the world. We have people like John Henry Clark, master teacher, brought us so much game, and we have the only bust of that brother. And I'm very proud of that, but it's so late, man. We, we have to immortalize some of our legends. It's very important that we prop up our legends. We have a bust of um, Dr. Francis Gress Welsing in the museum. We have a bust of Biddy Mason in the museum, who was a very important figure out here in LA. And now we have a bust of Dr. John Henry Clark. Very proud of that bust. It's very important for us to uplift these legends, ladies and gentlemen. And you guys need to come down to the Hidden History Museum. Y'all can come down all next week. Monday, come on down and get your DVDs and get your Blu-rays and T-shirts and all that stuff. If you were in L.A., I was at the museum earlier today. Shout out. A lot of folks came by today. It was a couple who came by from Dallas, uh, like Dallas-Fort Worth. I think they were from Dallas-Fort Worth. Beautiful couple. Beautiful FBA couple. 
lot of couples come through. It was a brother who came through from Arizona. They're downhill for some wrestling thing. Is some WWE thing happening in town? A brother came in town. He actually owned a bookstore in Arizona, and I forgot what the name was. He bought a whole bunch of wholesale books and DVDs from us at the museum. And I wish I remembered what the name of his bookstore was, but I think it's a black bookstore in Phoenix, Arizona. I think he said they're the only one. So if you were in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, you look up a black bookstore and you only see one, it's that brother. So we're doing real good business over at the Hidden History Museum, and y'all need to come on through. And uh, remember, we're going to have... Um, the comedy night popping off every week. We're going to start doing a, a weekly comedy night. We're going to start doing a, I'm, I'm looking into the poetry slam thing. A lot of people are telling me about poetry nights. We're thinking about doing a poetry night. I got to look more into that because I'm not too up on the poetry thing, but I'm getting a lot of requests for that. Um, I would like to kind of see the template in other cities to see how that works. And um, we're going to get that popping. But you guys need to um, check out HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. We've got a lot of great things happening at the museum, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, let me get some folks in here. Hold on. Let's get, um, let's get Brother Trey in here. All right, Trey, what's up, Trey? Let's get Trey in here. Trey, where you at, man? Hey, hey what's up, uh, Tariq? I'm good, man. What's hey, up? Uh, yeah, no, I was in L.A., so I was um, I, I, I was going to pull up on your, uh, what days you said you was going to have it? Um, the um, Well, the museum is open every day. It's Well, Monday through Friday, open every day from 11 to sometimes 4, but 11 to 5, but generally 11 to 4. But we, we're going to have the um, comedy joints popping off on Wednesday nights. Oh, that's a bet, man. I, I be on Clubhouse, man. I be defending you all the time, man. They ain't anyway, man, because I know, uh, you know, time is valuable. I'm willing to pay, man, for like an interview on Clubhouse to talk about the FBA and all the stuff you got going because I, I, I really fuck with the movement. No doubt. Uh, no. And, uh, yeah, and, that, uh, and, and um, Clubhouse, boy, that's, that's Tether Central. You have a bunch of Tethers on there who... <laughs> oh God! So yeah, the the tethers, they not only hate me, they hate all foundational Black Americans. I'm just a proxy. All right, when they talk about me, they're talking about all of us. They do not like foundational Black Americans. Um, that's why I've been slaying tethers verbally because of the the hatred that they've shown on Clubhouse. But yeah, I, I do something with you, man. I, I'd be glad to do an interview with you, man. Just let me know. And let's chop it up. Definitely us. Uh, oh yeah. So I, I I wanted to talk to you. So. Um... I'll be at your, um, I'll be at the museum this week, but, uh, so would you ever think about like doing like a, so you know how like they got the laugh factory, uh, in Hollywood, yeah. like a, like a black version of the laugh factory at your museum, at, at, at the absolutely. museum. Oh, absolutely, man. We had, uh, the event we had last week was so successful and people were so happy about it. We're going to keep that going. So we're going to just, just do that every week. And um, we, we're going to bring that Comedy Act Theater vibe back. Back in the day, we had a black comedy club called the Comedy Act Theater that was real popping. And that's, there's a void. We, there's a lot of stuff that we need out here. We're going to fill a lot of those voids with the museum. So, yeah, we're going to get that popping. So we'll keep you posted, man. We'll keep you posted. Definitely. Thank you, brother. Definitely, man. I appreciate you, No man. doubt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to get that real popping. Yeah, yeah. And, and and by the way, the have y'all seen some of the bad faith arguments from a lot of the tethers with this whole FBI ass talking point? The, that museum is a club, nigga. Yeah, yeah. We got a club night popping. We're going to have more club nights popping. So uh, these bad faith arguments, look, and family, don't be don't be fooled by the bad faith arguments that's coming from some intelligence agency because it's it's the same when you see a weak argument 
that's repeated over and over again, that's some in, that's coming from a central source. The white supremacists do that all the time. When when Tucker Carlson and some of these other right wing um, folks start regurgitating some real weird talking point, that's coming from some centralized think tank. So when you see a lot of these suspected tethers and um, suspected agents running around social media with some weird, weak, reaching talking point, that's coming from some centralized source, usually some type of intelligent agency. So now, because with the museum, the name of the game is for these intelligent agencies to get their minions to just be contrary towards the museum, no matter what. Because what we did with the museum was revolutionary foundation of black American family. We, the dominant society didn't want us to do that. We're not supposed to build things on our own without the dominant society helping us. Because that sends a dangerous message in their mind. That sends a message to other people. Hey, be independent. Get together with other black people and build some shit. They don't want that message out there. So the intelligence agencies, they send their minions out here to try to... Um, demonize it and, and undermine it by any means. So all of their bad faith talking points of how they've already fell flat and we already knew what those talking points were. The, the, the main talking point that the intelligent agencies was giving out was, well, the museum is never getting built, nigga. They kept saying that, remember? Where's that museum, nigga? Remember that talking? They said that the a month after we we didn't even get all the funding yet and we were hearing where's that museum nigga so that was a talking point given to some of the tethers and minions once we actually got it then the new talking point was well it is small nigga where is so why is small but then pictures start coming out showing there's hundreds of people in there so it's a great beautiful size museum so that talking point fell flat and none of the other talking points would work because the museum was actually very successful. We started having successful events, were sold out, so none of the other talking points was going to work. They couldn't say nothing about the food. Like, Where's the food, nigga? You know, because we, we had good food in there and the food was complimentary, so that talking point fell flat. Remember, the name of the game is to just be contrary. Just like when we did the conference down in Atlanta. Remember a couple of years ago, we were getting the conference together. Same thing. We getting the money together. Oh, y'all niggas are not going to have it. Y'all going to steal the money. Then we had it. Oh, y'all niggas, y'all having it, but it ain't going to be nobody there. When it was sold out, then they had to change the talking point. Well, why so many people in there? People going to get COVID. So remember, when y'all hear bad faith, weak arguments, I mean, you don't really have to defend it because it's in bad faith anyway. They're just going to move the goalposts, just like with the museum. Now that the museum is extremely successful, they can't complain about the food. They can't, they can't complain about the parking either. That was another bad faith argument they were going to get into. But they can't do that because we got valet. So parking was an issue. We had valet at the, the museum. So they can use that. They can't say anything about the food. They can't say anything about the size. So now, because it's so successful, the new talking point is, well, it is a club instead of a museum, nigga. It is a club. So that's the new bad faith talking point. And that's going to change next week, you know. No matter how irrational the talking point is, that's and, and as we know, all museums have nighttime events and parties and clubs and there's clubs slash museums all over the place. They know that. So the next talking point next week is when you niggas are going to give people bird flu. It's, it's going to be something stupid. The name of the game is to be contrary because we're not supposed to be successful. Anything that's independently black and successful, the intelligent agencies have to send their Negro minions out here to demonize it, no matter what, and just be contrary to it. So once we understand that part of the game, you keep on 
trucking and we keep on doing what we do. Let me get Brother Ra in here. Let me get Brother Raheem in here. What's up, Brother Ra? Hop on, bro. What's up, Brother Ra? Hey, peace. What's going on, black man? My man, I'm good. How are you, sir? I'm all right. I just wanted to uh, chime in. Um, I know you you talked about the task force in um, San Francisco. Yes. Um, yeah. A lot. A lot of uh, there was a lot of um, feedback on on people getting up there just babbling. But what was telling was the sister that got up there and, and talked about the NAACP and how they was involved in land theft. So mm. it, it, it's it's a lot that's being revealed in these task force meetings, and um, they're having them in in Atlanta, and I can't wait to see how how that uh, unfolds. But I just wanted to let the family know that we got to be very careful with a lot of these organizations say they're about reparations. And I'm particularly talking about these legacy organizations like, you know, the NAACPs and the uh, and Cobra and, and NARC. Um, there was an article, and I sent it to you, where it talked yes. about uh, Liberation Venture and how they moved $1 million to 14 Black-led reparation organizations, and they list all the names of these organizations. And this article came out February of 2022, and it talked about they was going to be given another million dollars in the second quarter of 2020, 2023. So they got their money for the war chest and family. We at yeah. war with these people that are trying to uh, lay claim to our reparations. So we got, we got to be vigilant and um, we definitely got to start showing up, man. Um, the ones that yes. can really speak on reparation and that's really about it and get some of these clowns out of the paint. I just want to say that. And, brother, I'll see you um, in Dallas. I'm definitely going to be there. I already got my plane ticket. My man, much respect to you, brother Ra. Thank you so much. Yeah, man, brother Ra sent me some some real heavy stuff, man, showing that um, a lot of these so-called reparations organizations, they've been papered up by some of these left-wing um, organizations so we see all of a sudden this is why when we see these reparations meetings people hop in there talking crazy I'm like what the hell are they talking about these so-called reparations organizations who we think are grassroots we're sitting up here yeah yeah we're gonna let them go up here and represent we're gonna let them go up here and represent and they're hanging around us talking our language to a certain degree and then all of a sudden they step up to the podium Bucking their eyes, talking crazy. So we really have to watch people out here, man. We got to watch people and see their track record and just kind of vet folks, man. They just can't use our language. Because, you know, you got a lot of people out here using the word reparation. You know, they have they got Ben and Jerry reparations ice cream now. So, yeah, don't let them symbolize the, the reparations thing. Turn it into one big symbolic gesture. Because they'll say the name, but won't stake the claim. So we have to make sure that we're going to get some tangibles out of this thing and make sure the language is right and make sure the represent the people who are representing is going to be um, thorough. We really got to keep our eyes on folks. Because some of these, uh, I'm seeing a lot of these reparations meetings popping up around the country on these Zoom calls and all this stuff and some of these people got real questionable backgrounds i saw some flyer today and I, there was a couple of about three or four there was about at least two or three women on there who i'm very familiar with who they ain't about no reparations i'm like why are they even on a a reparations um committee or conference board like that so we got to watch these folks, man. They'll take the word reparations and just remix it, and which is what they've been trying to do. We can't let them do that. We got to stay vigilant, man. We really got to be on top of ours with this thing. Let me get, um, let me see. Let's get a on code FBA. Let's get on code FBA in here. Mr. On code FBA, where you at, man? 
Peace to the family. Peace to the family, <clears throat> bro. Tariq. What's going? Cool? <clears throat> yes, sir. What's happening? Hey, man. Um, been a minute. Uh, listening to you. You know. Um, hitting colors really. You know, over my third eye. I just wanted to, you know, salute you for that, man. Back in 09, 2010, something yes. like that. When I first, you know, checked it out, and you know, it's no been doubt. on ever since. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But uh, I had a couple of things. One, representing Baltimore. Not everybody from Baltimore is with that Tahaka Bay guy. We don't well, rock I, with you. We not like that. That's number one. Um, I, I, several <laughs> several people from Baltimore have told me this. Yes, we fell yes, out here, bro. I'm letting you know that now. Um, number yeah. two. Well, actually, I got two more things. Number two. Um, when is the Hidden History Museum? You know, going to be open because I want to bring my little ladies out there, man. We just uh, came from the Smithsonian down in D.C. You know, like you said, oh, yeah. I mean, it's pretty cool. It's nice down there, but we got to get out there to the real. Um, one of my little ladies, she was just Biddy Mason for um, Black History Month. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Number three. Yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, my fault. My fault. But, yeah, the museum is open now. You can come. Yeah, you can come on Monday. It's open every day. Okay. Okay. Cool. 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 Um, I actually lost the third thing, but salute to the family. Salute to you too, bro. Like I said, man, um, you're a big reason. You're a big part of, uh, you know, why I'm, why I'm so strong at this shit now. Um, just salute, salute to the family. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you so much, man. Shout out to to that brother. But yeah, yeah, the museum, y'all go up there Monday, man. Just come on through and um, check it out and get you some DVDs, get you some Blu-rays and. Take some pictures and enjoy yourself. And let everybody know. Come on through. It's popping. Um, but man, he hit up, he up on something very important. A lot of folks, and I get this all the time, a lot of folks, man, really got up on a lot of game with the Hidden Colors series, man. The Hidden Colors series, and many, many people have said this, this ushered in the modern what we call woke movement that ushered it in and it did I, I will agree with that many people have said that it actually ushered in the what we call woke movement that woke a lot of people up y'all got to remember around 2010 that's when we started working on hidden colors hidden colors came out in 2011 we started working on it in 2010 Y'all remember, what nobody really woke around 2010 because we still had Obama. Obama had lulled everybody to damn sleep. You understand? We we have to, you know, we got to do, we got to make a, a documentary about the making of the Hidden Colors series because that's a thing within itself. We should make a documentary about the making of the Hidden Color series and what went into that and the drama surrounding that. That would be an interesting documentary within itself. You understand? That would be very interesting. But remember, 2010, folks weren't woke. Folks weren't on shit back then, man. Folks was as sleep as they wanted to be because of Obama's ass. Obama had everybody sleep, man. We're sitting around waiting on Obama to get stuff popping. And I knew then, I said, uh-oh, this is gonna, dangerous times are coming because we're too dependent on Obama and we're getting set up for a trick bag. It's, it's about to be Jim Crow again. I knew that was coming in 2010. I saw that shit coming. This was before all of these police murders like that. This was before all the police murders. Remember, the police murders really kicked in after George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin. That's when it really, really kicked in. And I saw that coming because I saw some of the movies that they were putting out and some of the images that they were putting out. They were putting out all of these crazy negative images of black people. And, and knowing history, whenever that happens, that those negative images usually come right before a societal onslaught of violence against black folks just like in the the 19 early 1900s before they started lynching black people in large large numbers they would put out movies like birth of a nation and stuff like that and put out these negative propaganda images in food and and retail products 
And that would justify harming black people. And I saw, and I just understanding history, remember 2010, the movies that were coming out around that time, around 2008, 2009, 2010, were movies like The Blind Side, The Butler, Pressures, The Help. It was all these movies showing us as subservient and slaves, man. All these movies. And I'm like, hey, man, this this isn't good for our collective psyche with images like that. And remember, y'all, some of y'all are kind of too young to remember. They were putting these images out and putting these movies out. And that messes with you psychologically as a black person seeing all of those derogatory images of yourself. And there was nothing to balance it. There was no counterbalance. I'm like, we have to balance this bullshit out. We, I, I remember seeing Precious, man. That shit made me depressed seeing that filth. I'm like, what the hell is that? That's a filthy ass movie, man. So any black person seeing that, man, you got to be psychologically debriefed after watching some filth like that. And white people love that movie. Remember, they gave that movie all types of awards. I said, no, 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 no. We we got to counter this, man. So I said, I'm about to make the blackest movie ever. Going in on white supremacy. And I want y'all to remember, man, when Hidden Colors first came out, man, a lot of, it was a, it was a huge success. But remember, man, a lot of folks, a lot of Negroes, in the establishment, they didn't like that movie. I was getting a lot of backlash from buck dancing Negroes. How many of y'all remember Wendy Wright? Where are my diehard Mac Lessons listeners who, who, who's who been with me since the Mac Lessons days? Y'all remember there's a, a sister named Wendy Wright out of D.C.? She was a radio DJ. Some of y'all raise your hand if you remember Wendy Wright. There was a whole thing. This is a, a, a boule bed wench who worked at a radio station and they had me on there and she was chastising me about offending white folks. And you got to hear it to believe it. Like, why would you make a film like that? You're going to get all of these good white folks offended. Niggas was talking like that, dude. Y'all don't understand. Folks are kind of woke now. Y'all don't understand how coonish niggas were back in those days they were like why are you offending these good white people you're gonna get these white people mad at us they were saying that with pride that's what that was the mindset back then we were shaking these fools up yeah so yeah we ushered that in we we mainstreamed wokeness and that came from a real grassroots place and we forced everybody else to get on board and this is when we started to see some of these tether publications and who they were and what their get down was because none of them would promote it none of these blogs they really didn't promote the movies like that even though the movies were hugely successful and that's another thing that made us look into who's running these blogs we started to say, hey, wait a minute, we got a successful, a series of successful films. The Hidden Color series is literally the most successful black history film series ever in history. I mean, we broke all types of records. And the media takeouts and the shade rooms and the world star and the bossips and none of Madam Noir, none of these people would cover it. And then we started looking into these people. Why do they cover all of these negative things within black society, but something this positive, they're not covering it. And to this, you know, to, to be honest, to this day, they barely cover it. They don't, you know, they'll, they'll mention me if they can throw something negative at me. But even to this day, they really don't mention that. And then we start seeing why they don't, because these publications are run by tethers who want to show negative images of us. Yeah. So it was up to us on the grassroots to really get this thing popping, man. The movements always come from the grassroots. It's always the grassroots, man. We can't wait on the corporate structure to do things for us. And we can't wait on the 
corporate entertainment structure to speak for us. That's why you got people out here now trying to remove our foundational black American legacy. You got people going away. I, I've seen videos of people like Ludacris over in Africa. Yeah, I'm in, I'm at home now over here with, you know, uh, I ain't doing that. Uh, yeah, I know his wife is African. I know that, but yeah, we, uh, yeah, y'all better read the room. We ain't really on that right now. And then Steve Harvey, we, I talked about that the other day, you know, Steve Harvey was over there pandering them Africans is us, man. We got the beat from them Africans, man. We look like them. No, we no, no, we don't, man. No, no. We we stole from Burner Boy, man. No, no, we didn't, Steve. No, we didn't. And that that's what I don't like. Let me, let me tell y'all something. I don't like that pandering. And the, the entertainment, I, I don't like that, dude. Because y'all y'all will throw our legacy and our culture under the bus just so you can get a come up. I don't, I don't rock like that, man. Let me tell y'all something. I get love. When I went to Africa, I get love in Africa. I get a lot of love. They actually roll out the red carpet for me. They like, over there, they like Foundation of Black American entertainers and, and people within the um, entertainment industry. People in the film industry, they like that. They, they'll they roll out the red carpet for you. And they did for me. When I'm over there, especially when I went to them, Zimbabwe, they rolled out the red carpet. When I was in South Africa, they rolled out the red carpet for me. But yeah, I'm over there. And they, I mean, they had like a dinner and they had like a little, almost like a little celebration for me one day. I didn't even know. They were like, we, we want you to come to a dinner. And then the dinner was for me. They had dancers and shit. They were giving me Joe Loft and I don't, I don't know what I'm eating. It was good. So yeah, they gave me, they were reading poems and shit to me. They, they rolled out the red carpet for me. You think? I'm like, this is cool. This is cool. But listen, what about the family? You know, that that's cool. I'm not an egotistical person. Now, I could go over there. Now, I, I got the kind of connections where I can go over there and they could personally, I can pull some strings and they can give me dual citizenship in one of those places easily. They'll give it to me. I can go there. They can possibly give me land. I can go over there. They they can give me land. I got connections over there. They'll roll the red carpet out for me. But the problem is, hey, what about the family? I'm a package deal. That's my whole vibe. And when I was over there, especially in Zimbabwe, I was in the media. I'm like, y'all showing me love, but listen, the black American family would like to come over, and we let's well, let's let's get some going. Let's get something. Let's get some for real going. And they weren't biting. And that's the problem that I have. See, I'm like Rick James. Now, Rick James was a rider. Rick James said, look, whatever you give me, you got to give to the Stone City Band. Rick James, like, if I go to Studio 54, you got to let the Stone City Band in the Studio 54. Because that's, remember, the Studio 54 was known for being racist. So they had a one nigga at a time rule. They'd only let one nigga in there. Now, Rick said, no, 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 no. If I go in, the Stone City Band goes in too. If you give me some cocaine, have some cocaine for the Stone City Band, nigga. You know, so that was my vibe. I'm like, look, I, I come as a package. You're not going to roll the red carpet out for me and then shit on the rest of the foundational black American family. That's not going to work. If you ain't fucking with them, then you ain't really fucking with me. That was my vibe. I'm not, I don't, I don't do all that. Y'all going to shower me. No, no, that, that's not cool. I don't know. I'm not cool with that. I'm not cool with that at all. You, you see? So that's why a lot of the, the, some of the tether classes be like, you loved us before we love you. Why are you hating on us? I'm not hating on you, but I'm just calling out the anti-FBA bullshit. I'm not having that. 
No, y'all not going to be cool with me and then shitty with the family. I'm not doing that. I'm not Steve. I'm not going to sit up here and give up my cultural legacy and um, um, erase the FBA family's history because I'm getting a fucking come up. No, it don't work like that. Uh, I'm not desperate for a dollar, dude. I'm a hustler, dude. I was in these streets for years. I know how to get some paper. Paper ain't new to me. Yeah. That shit is not new. And I ain't... And I'm not just going to throw everybody under the bus so I can get a little something. It ain't that serious, you know? So it's a respect thing. So this is why we go hard on these tethers because we've done a lot. We've rolled out the red carpet. So I don't, I don't take any kind of disrespect, none. And you're going to have to show respect to the family. That's how that works. Cause I'm like, shit, man, I'm not, I, I'm just not taking any more disrespect of our culture. And too many people have gotten comfortable disrespecting foundational black American culture. And we've done so much to help people. We've jeopardized our own safety and our own lives to help all these other people. And I'm saying me, myself, personally, I've done that too. That's why, man, I'm, I'm, I, I'm banned from the damn UK, man. I can't even go to a damn country because I'm trying to link up with brothers and sisters to, to fight the oppressive system. I'm talking about, nigga, these folks are talking about throwing me in jail if I ever go to the UK. I'm talking about jail, nigga. I can't even have a layover. These motherfuckers will detain me because I'm sitting here fighting white supremacy globally and linking up with brothers and sisters and trying to give them some game and I'm putting my safety in jeopardy. So if a motherfucker come over here talking about on a kata and all, nigga, no. No, no, no. We ain't doing that. I ain't jeopardizing my damn safety and niggas coming over here and we are katas no y'all send i'm over here fighting white supremacy in the uk to the point where they about to lock me up and in exchange y'all send musty ass cynthia revo over here to talk shit and then try to play our icons no hell no yeah i got a problem with that that's why i've been going in on these folks no no, 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 no. We're not playing that game. We put our lives on the line and then y'all send over a bunch of jealous tethers in exchange. Yeah, we, we feel a certain way about that. I personally feel a certain way about that because we've done too much to help folks and it's been one sided and it ain't going to be one sided no more. That's why I'm Many of the people who be hating on our museum are tethers. So that makes me go double hard. You really going to get this work. Let me get some folks in this room here. Um, who we got? We got a lot of folks in here. Who is this? Let's get um, Bratnella. Let's get Bratnella in here. What's up, Bratnella? Bratnella. Hop on. Hi, Tariq. What's going on, Bradnella? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You okay over there? Mm, sort of kind of. But let me do a, a quick disclaimer before I tell you why I raised my hand. Um, for all the um, naysayers and for all the ones who are sitting back and saying, it's a gotcha moment, miss us all with that BS. Now, Tariq, I'm a slightly heartbroken I, last time I talked to you was on December the 24th, a rest of Sussy Day. Mm -hmm. And you did a, a Twitter space about what books are you reading now. I told you I was yes. reading the United Independent Code Compensatory Code System Content, right. as well as Michelle um, Alexander, the new Jim Crow. However, I was I had ordered your package for the a resuscitary package. Yeah. And somehow or another, Something got mixed up, and I never got my packet. This, you no, know, I just want to let you know that I was quickly refunded my money, but I really, really wanted that that package material. So, did you give us the right address, dear? I gave you an address that um, 
to my daughter's address, and, and I did send a uh, a text message asking, can it be changed to my current address? But that, that's what it was. Okay, that, see, sister, when that happens, that fucks everything up. Y okay. That messes every Yeah, sister, when y'all do that, I'm telling y'all, folks, y'all gonna mess your orders up, because we send everything out extremely fast. I know you said and that. Yeah, yeah, we get them, we send them out. When you order, we'll send it out really the same day, so we don't get backed up. Because we get so many orders in, and then we all be like, "Well, I sent it. Is that my cousin house and the projects?" And all. then we got a back, and then that takes time because we already flooded with orders. So then we got to backpedal it. In. So then it's, it's sometimes it's just easier for us to just refund you. But but email me. We'll talk. About well, it. we'll I tried you. emailing you before, but it's not going through. I'm not getting no responses. I really want the stuff. That was my oh, birthday Lord. present to myself. Okay, I'm I'm on, I'm going to get it to you, dear. Um, email me. Listen, sister. Email me info at tarikaelite.com. I'm going to make sure that my assistant gets some stuff to you. Info at tarikaelite.com. I okay? love you, Tariq. And hello, everybody, to the room. I didn't mean to be disrespectful. You know, I'm just all you are disrespectful. No, no, no. You're good. You know. Okay. Thank you so. Much. Thank. You. I love you. Thank. You. I love you too, dear. I had to do a customer service call. That happens every now and then. We do a customer service call. All right, let's get um, the Dwella. The, um, I can't pronounce your name, brother. Dwella, do Dwella. What's your name, bro? Yeah, my fault, brother. I just wanted to um, make a quick point and just tell Go you ahead. that uh, everybody from where I'm at, we, we, we fully support you and we love you for what you're doing out here. And that's all I want to say. My man, I appreciate that, brother. Much respect to you. Much respect to the family. Yes. Yeah, listen, family, when y'all order something from us, please have the right address. Please, please, please make sure you have the right address. If you have, if y'all put the wrong address in, um, that's going to just kill your order, man. Because it's, it's, it takes a lot for us to backtrack and start looking for old orders because we're so busy getting orders out because we send them we're going to send it out that day and then we have to if we send it out and then you send another order then we gotta it's just a lot of it's a it's a it's a process so the best thing is to make sure you send it to the right address don't send it to your daughter's apartment in the projects and also if you live in an apartment that's another thing because i don't know why folks do this Y'all put your apartment number on there. A lot of folks, y'all live in the projects, and there's nothing wrong with the projects. If you put the project apartment number on there, all right? Put the project apartment number on there. We, we, we can't, you know, somebody in apartment 3D, they're going to get your package, and y'all going to be mad because they're going to steal your shit. They're going to steal your package. They're going to see your name and they don't give a damn. They're going to steal your package. And you're going to be like, damn, how come he has on a, a Rutgers Tussey sweater? And you're going to that's your sweater. Shit. You got a nigga out here trapping in your sweater. And, and you emailing me. And you should have gave the apartment number. You should have let us know what apartment you in. And now your sweater... Got all types of Capri Sun stains on it, and they done stunk your sweater up. And now a retrocessy is over. And now you ass out. So please put your housing project apartment number or whatever you, wherever you live, and or have it sent to your house. I don't know why you haven't it sent to your, your relative's house. Some of y'all be living in halfway houses. Some of y'all doing little prison stints. And I get it. You want to? You got used to reading in jail, and you want books sent to the halfway house, and you want to send it to your cousin's house. You don't want the books sent. To, you know, you y'all got to work that out. We we'll send books to the halfway house. We'll send books to the halfway house if they allow it. So y'all don't trip. Okay, let's see who else we got. We got a lot of people in here. Let's get um OG Black American. All right. OG Black American hop on. And I'm sitting here. My lovely wife is sitting here with me. 
my lady sitting over here looking fine. Well, she was looking so fine last night, boy. She was looking fine last night. And I've been going out of town. And I came home. And I saw that bubble. And that bubble is going to get you in trouble. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Tariq? Man. What's up, good? How you doing? Bro? I'm cool, man, on this Friday night. I'm, I'm over here, and I just bought um, the American Maroon um, DVD. Yesterday, I dropped by the museum yeah. and bought me a copy, so... Me and my mom going to watch it. Okay. She has roots in South Carolina, uh, Gullah, and also Seminole roots. So that's going to be really cool. To, oh, good. Um, are you in L.A.? Are you live in L.A.? Yeah, I live in Long Beach, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm in L.A. Oh, cool. Um, cool, cool, yeah. Um, I was. Did you look around the museum or you just went to, to buy something real quick? Well, because I knew you guys weren't open. They said that y'all weren't open yet. Um, so I just went to buy something, man. And the, and the sister was real nice to... Um, to have me like to wait for me because <laughs> I was in traffic, man, coming from from Hollywood, you know. Um, oh yeah. But man, I had a question about the hip hop documentary. So, are you focusing on the East and West Coast, or I mean, are you just going to do the East you know, Coast? Um, because I do want to do something about the West Coast too. But with this documentary, I want to focus on really the origins and the southern influences of hip hop yes. and um, and just really talk about what was going on in the Bronx between that 1972 and 1976 era yeah. because they keep jumbling a lot of that up and I want to get all of that straight I want to talk about the FBA influences on all the elements of hip hop culture yep so that one is going to be a lot of historic stuff in that man so yeah, we're gonna start filming that actually next month. That's awesome. So I keep you guys. Yes, indeed. Yeah, a lot of cats like, don't realize a lot of that stuff started even. I mean, of course, we both know about the stuff that preceded it, but like the late '60s, a lot of those guys. I've seen interviews, Trixie talking about a uh, you know, a lot of those cats started like in the late '60s, you know, like '68, '69, 1970, '71 before a lot of a lot of the, the the supposed year of all that you know so i don't know why they yeah. just say 1973 is the start and we've had elements of that right way before that <laughs> you know like yeah real talk real talk man yeah so yeah we're gonna get all that clear man thank you for the call but yeah i uh, man listen 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 um we're going to get deep in that documentary about the hip hop, man. I'm, I'm getting that together right now. I'm starting to write the treatment out. We're going to um, really get into where all this stuff came from. This bullshit about 50, 50 Latinos come, dude. No, 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 no. We're not playing that game, dude. We're not playing that at all. We're going to get some straightening because again, we're gatekeeping the culture, man. We're gatekeeping our culture. We've given away too much. And when you give away so much stuff, people will turn around and say, well, how come you ain't got nothing? We got all the culture and you ain't got nothing. Well, damn it, I just gave everything away. So now we're, we're claiming all of our stuff. I'm claiming all of it. We got to claim all of it, dude. We have to claim every single parts of our culture because we've created so much stuff and we're so generous with it. We think if we just share with everybody that there's going to be some kind of appreciation and what happens is there's contempt. So yeah, hip hop, now that it's a positive thing, now it's supposed to be shared. We got to share with everybody. But remember, when hip hop was looked at as negative, that was a black thing, particularly a foundational black American thing. They were saying, y'all stay away from those Akatas, those hip hop niggas. They were on that shit. You think? Everybody will stay away from those hip hop niggas. Now that it's a popular multi-billion dollar genre, well, we all created it, nigga. Well, in fact, you got it from us. And then you got Steve Harvey running around. They come on, man. They got that beat from, and them Africans gave them that beat, man. Man, stop. <laughs> they got the beat from Africa, man. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about, Steve? 
Read the room, dude. <laughs> Man, please. You ain't get no damn beats from them. And no no disrespect. Come on. No. You ain't gonna tell no damn lie like that. That those lies are over. That bullshit right there. That whole boule Tom Joyner crowd, they like, you know, they'll they'll throw our culture away if they can get them something. We ain't going for them lies no more. No. We are not doing that. I am not going to sit up here and let somebody say we done stole something from Burner Boy. That don't make no sense in nobody's damn universe. Y'all stole the beat from Burner Boy, man. The fuck you? No. What are you talking about? The hell? And with Burner Boy, I don't have a problem with Burner Boy, but boy, they really put extras on Burner Boy. They get somebody, they get one person who can kind of rap on beat and whatever, and they try to compare that dude to to the Beyonce's and all of that. They really try to hang their hat on Burner Boy, dude. Yeah, congratulations. I, you know, the dude is you know selling records. Cool. I like some of his music, but damn. You know, y'all not about to sit up here and make this dude out to be something that he ain't. Now. This dude ain't on the level of our greats. Come on. Stop it. Okay, let's get um, some more people in here. Let's get Brother Sonny in here. Sonny, hop in, man. Hop in, Sonny. <clears throat> what up? Can you hear me? What's up? What's good? I'm good. Sonny, what's on your mind, What's bro? good? Um, back to the hip-hop question. Uh, I had two questions. What made you decide to want to do, like, a hip-hop documentary and actually, like, dig into the history, like, with, like, a fine-tooth comb like that? And then, two, do you face any backlash from that as far as that? Because you know you are a West Coast dude, and the hip-hop is an East Coast-generated thing. So do you ever get any controversy with that? Or... You know, what What backlash do you get by trying to get to the origins of hip-hop and, like, really, really, really comb through it and, like, delineate with that? Go ahead. All right. Good, good questions. Um, what made me want to do it, I've been wanting to do a hip-hop documentary just to talk about, for a long time, just to talk about the FBA origins of it. Because, um, you know, we, all the elements of hip-hop, and you know, I've always done history films, and we've touched a little on hip hop in some of the Hidden Colors films. But I've always wanted to just go deep and just talk about some of the real origins of it. Now, with a lot of these people trying to claim jump hip hop, I'm like, I really got to do it now. I really have to prioritize this. When Buster and all of these people, Fat Joe, come out here talking about hip hop, black and Latinos, fifty fifty. Y'all, we really have to understand how dangerous that is for dude to say that. That's some colonizing nonsense. When somebody says that, which is completely untrue, and he knows it's untrue, Fat Joe, when he said that, he knew what he was saying was not true. And even when I talk to the legends, I listen, I've been, I'm already chopping it up with some of the original forefathers. Even they are like, no. Nah, that ain't true. Even Grandmaster Kaz, let's be real. When Grandmaster Kaz did that infamous that video with, with Vlad, Kaz was telling the truth. He was like, yeah, there were no Latinos around us at all. It was like one or two. But with, with Kaz, and Kaz started backtracking, which I didn't like, and Kaz is my guy. I like Kaz. But Kaz started backpedaling because what happens is, this is the thing, with, with a lot of the old school hip hop artists, man, a lot of the tours they go on, it's like white and Latinos who really patronize them and bring them on board. So they got to pander to a certain degree now, which is unfortunate. So when you say, well, no, y'all Latinos weren't really around, some of that show money might start drying up. You, you know what I'm saying? And so he might have to backpedal. He, well, you know, uh, some of them were around. There was Joe Conzo taking pictures. Uh, no, just keep it a buck. They weren't around. You know that. And when you talk to brothers out there in the Bronx, it, 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 there's really no backlash because when you talk to black folks who were in the Bronx in the 70s, every single one of them will tell you the Puerto Ricans weren't really kicking it with us like that as far as the hip-hop thing. They'll tell you. 
there's no real backlash, to be honest. Because you got brothers and sisters who grew up in the 70s, 60s, and 70s who are from the Bronx, and they'll tell you that period, um, early 70s, going into around 76, well, no Puerto Ricans around none of the DJ circles and the hip-hop circles, they will tell you. They, I mean, shit, facts are facts. And some of the old hip-hop heads, I've talked to Shy Rock, and you know they'll tell you. They just weren't around like that. They came later. And I've always said the Latinos, they were the first students of hip hop. That's okay. We don't have to share something that you didn't do. You didn't create nothing as far as hip hop. You didn't. And then they start talking about crazy legs. Crazy legs start popping in the 80s, man. His shit start popping off in the 80s. And he was a student of hip hop. And now crazy legs, speaking of crazy legs, he's running around here trying to if, if a motherfucker ate a taco in the 70s, he's trying to say that that, that contributed to hip-hop. And, and they, they're grabbing onto anything. They're just grabbing onto any goddamn thing and trying to make that some 50-50. Now, man, no, we ain't doing that, dude. We're not doing that. So what I want to do, I want to get into the southern origins of hip-hop, what was going on in the Carolinas, the the rhyming that we were doing that's nothing new we got records where we're rhyming over beats going back to the 1920s we got images and, and videos of black folks dancing that looks like up rocking doing floor work in the 1930s and 40s man we come on man oh yeah we 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 we're, we're getting our culture back we're getting it back. We, we're not going to make our shit community property. We're gonna, people are going to still respect it. People are going to still respect it. Right, let me get some more people in here. 